Welcome to Grant's Rock Warehouse and to the interview. Tonight in the hot seat is Eric Schmitz, guitarist from the 1990s band Flowerhead. Flowerhead started out in 1987 by founding members Eric Faust and Buzz Zoller. Eric Schmitz joined the band in 1989 and Pete Levine rounded out this classic lineup in 1990. Soon after they were discovered by A&R guru for BMG Zoo Entertainment, Scott Byron. The band put out two studio albums for Zoo, Kaboom in 1992 and The People's Fuzz in 1995. The band put out three singles, Snagglepuss in 1992, Acid Rain, and Everything is Beautiful. In 1995, Flowerhead felt the impact of BMG's downsizing. Continued touring, including a brief time with Cheap Trick, until the summer of 95 when they decided to go on hiatus. Without any further ado, let's get to Eric Schmitz and to the Flowerhead interview. Welcome to Grant's Rock Warehouse, and tonight I want to welcome Eric Schmitz from the band Flowerhead. Eric, how are you, and how's everything going? Doing great, Grant. So good to talk to you, man. It's yeah, awesome. Like I, like I was telling you, you know, when we talked earlier, mm-hmm. seeing you get excited about Flowerhead, talking to our old A&R guy, that I, I can't describe how that felt. You know, we're looking at 30 years since that since Kabloom was released and just to have someone like you care it it means the world to me man well the thing is when I was talking to Scott so anybody wants to know Scott Byron we did a Matthew Sweet series and well we're still doing a Matthew Sweet series but we did an interview with Scott Byron who is the A&R rep for Zoo Entertainment who brought Matthew Sweet to Zoo found Flowerhead as well we'll get to that story and he I, I, I talked to him and said, well, Scott, since we have you on the show, because I'm always, the whole point of my show, Eric, a lot of it, I know we cover some bands that people cover, but like today I was on the Contrarians and we covered Billy Squire. No one really talks about Billy, Billy Squire right. anymore. Right. So we're trying to give a lot of these old bands that don't have a lot of recognition, maybe get them back out there. Have people go out and search for them. Look for their stuff. Maybe you never know; it might take off. I mean, it's great <laughs> stuff. So, like I said, I asked Scott. So, Scott, what other zoo artists would you recommend? Because how would I ever really know? You know, unless I'd ask. And he right. spoke really highly of Flowerhead. And what was the other one? Well, the anyway, uh, yes, yeah, I got a yeah. couple of those. And. um I went, all right. And like you saw on the show, I was getting on Discogs and just ordering them right then because yeah. why yeah. not? That was so great. Anyway, I do have them. Here's the uh, first Flowerhead album, and then here's the second album. And we're going to talk about both of these records, and we're going to talk about that cassette. I guess, w- would you consider that like your the EP? I guess it's an EP. Yeah, Terminal in the Toy Box. Yeah, what would you, I guess that's a cassette EP. Yeah, that was our DIY about? release okay. when we said, of course, we we didn't have a label. And so like a lot of other bands, we said, we don't need one. We'll just, we'll do our own. We took a, you know, the old Tascam four track mm-hmm. and in an empty house, it was next to our, our singers. Uh, it was a duplex and one side of it was empty. And we just went into that, that side of the duplex that, that uh, not sure if it was legal or not. But we ran extension cords over there, and uh, and made a little little record. And there you are. You can get those. Yeah. You can still find those on uh, Discogs. I looked that up today. I was surprised to see them out there. Um, but we'll get to that. I just want to start out real quick, though. Obviously, you're a guitar player. Uh, just uh, let's just start a little bit of history before we start talking about Flowerhead. Um. You know, when we're kids, we always have those moments where the sky parts and you hear some song or some band or some music that just like changes your life. Did you ever have one of those moments? What are what were your like first musical memories like when you're a kid? Do you have any of those type of things? Well, my, my grandmother played guitar okay. and she she was in everything, you know, definitely more on the countryside and the blues, you know, like Jimmy Rogers and and some of those old guys. And uh, so as long as I can remember, 
I, I thought the guitar was cool, wanted to play it, had a cousin that played. And, uh, but, you know, if you're looking for that, that one magical sound, I, I'd have to say it was the, the, the Guess Who, oh, wow. American Woman, mm -hmm. you know, and when that, when that fuzzy solo kicked in that that was like a, a guitar sound I'd never heard before you know I put put that and Beatles revolution together you know just that fuzzy mm -hmm. uh, distorted guitar sound and then I was like I knew then that I, that's what I want to do I want to play that kind of guitar like that you know I, I'll never be Chet a Aikens I don't think but I, I I think I can turn up an amp real loud and get oh, some no. noise. I was checking out some I was checking out some live flowerhead footage on YouTube. You, you, you're okay. You don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So there was music in your family. So there you go. So you were introduced. Gosh, how old were you when you started playing guitar? I got my first guitar on my 12th birthday in, in 1978. I was going to a, uh, a Catholic school in Irving, Texas. Mm -hmm. And I was classmates with... Mike Skasha, who is a little bit more famous than I ever was, I'd have to say. He's, he was the, he, when I was still in college, he, his band Rigor Mortis had already signed to Capitol Records, and he was getting written up in local Dallas magazines and even national magazines as the speed guitar hero. But it started back when we were at that Catholic school. We had a, a drummer that also had a musical family. His name was Nicky Papa. And his uncle, Tony Papa, had been a big band leader, drummer in, in the 50s. And, and of course, we, when we were doing this in the 70s, Tony Papa was working, booking acts for The Tonight Show. You know, and then so he had that connection. Skasha had a connection in his sister who worked for Warner Brothers Records. And so he, he had a record collection of punch outs that was just unbelievable. I mean, it was just a wall of records like, you, you know, guys my age now barely even had he had back then. Oh my. And uh, and we would do do, you know, anything we could to be able to set up and play and we had this music teacher, her name is Margaret Barnes. And, and she, you know, she taught the normal Catholic school kind of, you know, stuff in her music class, but off to the side, she was kind of a rocker. And so she encouraged us to, you know, besides playing, you know, Michael Row the Boat Ashore or whatever it was we were playing, we, we would set up in the choir loft of the church, at least until the day that we cranked up highway to hell as as loud as we could in in the choir loft of the church and we kind of that kind of ended that <laughs> that little spree so you picked up the guitar at 12 what type i know we're going to probably talk some gear because i can't help myself i started playing when i was 13 so that was 78 and i started Very good. same type of thing and when i it was me when i was like 10 is when i heard the beatles I've told this story on this channel. Before. I haven't heard it. All right. So I was 10. I was over at my friend's house and I was and you know, I was a record crazed kid. I had like one of those Kenner close and play record players when yeah. I was like three or four. Right. But 10. So I was, you know, had a lot of Walt Disney records and I was just fascinated by records and they had a, a thing of 45s and one of those wire holders you know that you would hold your 45s i so, still have them there you go <laughs> so i'm going through and they had two singles they had i want to hold your hand and she loves you in the picture sleeves so i'm looking at yeah. it and i'm going because before that all my parents ever played were like lawrence welk neil diamond maybe i don't even remember right. that really but that might have been later but a lot of lawrence welk they grew up, you know, during the 40s. They like Benny Goodman. So I hadn't heard any popular music at all. So I, I looked at the picture sleeves. I'm going, wow, these guys look kind of cool. I don't know anything. It's like 1975. I had no idea. And I said, well, can I borrow these to play them? And they let me borrow them. And I just heard them. And it's like the heavens opened. It's like the yeah. waters parted. Because I'd never heard anything like it. 
you know, I, I want to hold your hand. I just, holy crap. It was incredible. Yeah, uh, no, it's very similar stories, although I will say because of my grandmother, that was my, my mom's uh, mother, and, and it, she made my mom the cool kid on the block, you know, so she had the Elvis records, mm -hmm. uh, all the stuff that the parents typically weren't that happy about their kids, especially their daughters listening to, they listened to. She, she, she and her friend uh, Margie, both under five feet tall at the time when they were 14 years old, snuck out of the house, got on a bus and went to see Fats Domino in downtown Dallas uh -huh. when they were 14 years old. And so you can kind of imagine what that di dynamic was like. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember asking her, you know, were y'all, were y'all scared? And she said, we didn't know it, if any reason to be scared. And then, of course, once they did show up, there they weren't the only two um, girls like the, themselves at that show. But they, the the bouncers, if you will, whoever the guys running the show knew to keep them all in one place and to keep them as safe as they could possibly be, because that their success hinged on that. And so uh, that that's probably the coolest. Um, family related rock and roll story but but when we grew up you, you mentioned the 45s mm -hmm. we had a jukebox you know mm -hmm. so the, and i still have the the actual record from from that jukebox along with a ton of the other records but it was it was dr hook in the medicine show the cover of the rolling stone yeah. right yeah that's that was where the beginnings were and then you know like i said when i when i hooked up with these other guys yeah, let's face it, it was 1977, right? It was Kiss. Yeah, it was all about Kiss. And then we had that phase. And then, you know, and then you progress musically. And then suddenly you hate Kiss. And then Led Zeppelin, everything was Led Zeppelin. And, you know, so then it was Led Zeppelin and, and, the, and the Who and Deep Purple and then Black Sabbath. And and just just all that stuff just starts starts opening up, and then and then I did what a lot of a lot of guitarists you, know, you may have done the same thing, you get into the real the really good stuff. Um, well, I, I say good, but I mean technical stuff. So I was a, a huge Rush fan by the time I got to, to high school. Yeah, yeah, I was like turned on to Rush in like 1978, Hemispheres. Right. Uh, you know, when I was like 13, holy crap, Beatles. Right, La Villa Rush. Strangiato, and you're going, whoa, yeah. I had like a little Sanyo radio with a, it was mono, and I would record my records onto it so I could take the radio right. out with me and listen to it. Yeah. You know, that's what we did then. Yeah, that exactly. Like, oh my God, when I heard Rush, it totally, it was like another, it was like another one of those moments. It yeah. Just like, you know, I hadn't heard anything else like it. And, and they and they print all the lyrics with everything. A lot of bands did. I, I, I always liked that. And you know, I know we're going to talk about our albums, and mm -hmm. and and I was a, a, a fan of that. Although I rarely wrote any of the lyrics. And uh, Eric Faust, you know, since he was a singer, and half the time we didn't even know what he was really even saying, and half the time I'm not sure if he did. He he was more interested in getting the the vocal melodies down. And so when the idea came up of printing our lyrics, I think he was like, ah, I'd, I'd rather people just try to figure out what they are, you know, and, and what they mean, as opposed to just having them. He wanted people to, to hear and feel the music as, as opposed to just looking at it. Yeah, that music. makes sense. Makes total sense. So what was you? I know we're hanging out on guitar a little bit, but what was your first guitar? I just have to know. What was it? What did you it, have? It was a Kent, you know, like a like a Mustang copy, just a typical sunburst, you know, Fender Mustang copy. Mm -hmm. And then and then but right after that, I've got and I know there's a picture out there. I wish it was clear, but there's a picture of me, you know, standing in my in my kitchen in Irving. I got the Kent Effector and it had it was a Les Paul copy, but it had built in effects. So it had like a tremolo. Uh, it had something that was a wah. I think it worked kind of like a, an envelope filter, you know, just when you, but the main thing it had on there was fuzz. 
you know, and I think that's what it said was fuzz. And, and you put that on, and like I was talking about before, that's when I had that sound. Of course, I learned the hard way that if you didn't unplug everything and turn everything off correctly, it would burn out the nine volt battery that was in there. Mm-hmm. And so I spent half the time with a dead battery and no fuzz, you know. That's no fun. <laughs> That's awesome. So you go to high school. Did you play any like in any high school bands or anything? Yeah, absolutely. You know, freshman year it was a you know, some girls that wanted to be in the talent show and they got they got me and and, and my buddy uh John Cochran to to play Hit Me With Your Best Shot. You know. And so and we got the my friend Nikki, you know, on drums and, and all that, and we just kind of faked our way through it, I guess. And, and, and that was fun. But then after that, we said, Hey, we're, we're doing our own bands. We're going to play, uh, we're going to play some Judas Priest, um, April wine. We did. I liked to rock, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, cause they were huge, huge at that time. Um, and, and then, and then in the later years and, and there's also, you know, some graphics to, to this you can find, uh, we did, there was a, there was a local lake in the Dallas Fort Worth area called North Lake, and it, it was it's really in like North Irving, and they had these pavilions and things, and so you could go to the Dallas Parks and Recreation in, in Fair Park and get a permit to have a concert, you know whatever they would want to call it, family picnic, whatever you'd want to call it. But the key was you'd get the permit so they would turn the power on. And it was like these outdoor pavilions. So they had a roof and then, you know, just four big pillars. And then they had power on those pillars. And so we would rent, rent the mixing, you know, the PA, the mixing, big mixing board and, and speakers from a local, you know, company. And, and then we printed up and we sold tickets um, to, to people at our high school and then the other high schools and anyone else that wanted them. And then of course we, we would sell tickets at the door. Of course there was really no door. So (laughs) all anyone had to do to, to to go to that show without a ticket was just drive across some grass, (laughs) but the North, we had the North Lake jam and then the North Lake jam too. When I was, when I was a senior and and it was all uh, with the guys, there was, there was actually a lot of activity in, in Irving. Yeah, I mentioned Mike Scotia, but there was all this other group of guys and everybody learned from this, the same shop for the most part. I mean, there was Murphy's music, but for a lot of us, it was Wiggly and Son Music Company. And it was a guy whose mom had always sold pianos and band instruments, all the traditional stuff. Of course, he grew up in the 60s and really got going in the early 70s with his bands and everything. And uh, so he was he was the rock and roll place. And and so a lot of these guys were everybody would switch bands. So, you know, you'd have one lineup of some of these guys. And then by the next year, everybody had kind of switched places. This drummer was over here now and this guitarist was over here. But one of the one of the better musicians and better singers, I should say, which was that was the key back then, because a lot of people could play guitar and drums back then, as you know, it was getting a good singer. And then also bass players were, were rare. But a, a guy who did did a little bit of everything. He's now a, a fairly big time Elvis impersonator. His name is Craig Parker. But he, so he was, his bands were typically like the headliners of the, of the North Lake Dams and, uh, and, and Cochran, who I'd mentioned before, played with him. But yeah, so it was kind of a whole little scene we had going there. And, and that was really just the Irving High piece. And then, you know, the MacArthur High, they had a lot of, lot of own players in, in there, right? But we did have our bass player was Eric Faust, who was the, the, oh. the bass and lead singer for Flowerhead. And, I don't know. I, I don't remember exactly how we ended up with our singers, but he, he focused more on just playing bass back then and just, just having a good time. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it was we college, kinda, of course. yeah, we kind of went separate ways for college. Okay. And, and this will tie in to another story. If we get a chance to, to tell he, he had grown up sailing, you know, sailboats. And so he, he got a scholarship to sail at USC oh, wow. and which, so, which of course he couldn't turn down. And, and then I went to the University of Texas at Austin. 
Well, by, by our sophomore year, he came to Austin to, to go to school. So about the time that I, that I was a junior, senior, I was a five, fifth year senior. So maybe been more around that time. I was in the, uh, the College of Radio, Television and Film, getting my degree there in the, the audio production track. Mm-hmm. And Faust had hooked up with Buzz and, and then Keith Moore um, and, and Mike Ware. And they had a little group they were calling the Subterraneans. And I needed bands to do my recording projects for my audio production classes. And they, they had kind of gotten together. They weren't really gigging. They maybe played a couple of those, um, you know, where the dorms would just do something where the band, you know, anybody who wanted to could kind of set up and play it at, at a dorm or something like that. They may have done a few of those, but we, we did a lot of, uh, of recordings. I, I still have those. I wish they were better quality. Um, but I did all that. We'd have to, we'd have to record the first project with no reverb. You know, and then the next project, okay, on this one, you can use a reverb and a little bit of delay and a little bit of EQ. You know, we would kind of slowly get, get through each, each of the, each of the, you know, the progress of of the class. But by the time we were done and they would have, you know, the film school and and the TV production people, they would have this big thing at the end of the year where they would show everybody's um, work the the little short films or whatever their tv show or whatever they did and in between there they would play um you know the music from the audio classes and 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 i think yeah they were flowerhead by the end of all that so probably 80 percent of the music they played in between everything was flowerhead and so that would be like what year ish that 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 was 1988 89 Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and so, so then, and then Faust was an advertising major. So he would also use me in the studio, the studio, my access to the studio to put together his, you know, radio commercials or w- w- whatever he did. And, um, and then after that, uh, they kind of started, you know, everyone was graduating and, but Eric and Buzz wanted to keep going, you know, so they asked me to join. Mm-hmm. And that's when we did guitar and beer can with with Mike Ware on drums, and then I guess Mike graduated and was just moving on. You know, life happens. It, you know, it's not like we were really doing very much with with the band. And then I we, mean, had we, you guys? I don't want to interrupt, but did you guys yeah. had you guys played out yet, or had Faust or those guys played out as? Yeah, I wouldn't say in any of the the clubs. It was more just like campus events, like I was talking about earlier. It might be a dorm or just like a party. Um, so we did do a few of those kind of things, but things really took off when, you know, we just put an ad in the Austin Chronicle, just like every other band was doing at the time for a drummer. And, and that's when Pete Levine showed up and, uh, <laughs> have you ever seen that? Of course you've seen it. The movie, the wonders. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like that that's what Pete did to flowerhead. If you remember, he, he, he play, he's playing in practice. He's playing just kind of slow. And then when they actually start to play, he just, boom, all this energy. That's, that's what Pete brought to Flowerhead. And, and then, you know, also with a, a hell of a lot of punk rock attitude and, and a lot more experience. He was, he was about five years older than we were. We were all right at the same age, you know, in class. And, and that's when the guitar, the, the volume started going up on the guitars. We started ro- writing more rock riffs. And then, of course, that's what that's what they wanted in the clubs. So we started doing gig, regular gigs at uh, the Texas Tavern first. And then and then the Can- Cannibal Club became our kind of our main main scene, which it was for a lot of the you know alternative bands back then in Austin. So um, once you got him as a drummer, did you feel at that moment like, holy crap, we might be onto something? I mean, did it just seem to gel then? You know, we, we, we weren't, I don't think any of us were really all that, uh, Pete might have been because of his experience and, and some of the things that he was doing, but we were just kind of, let's just see what happens. Mm-hmm. You know, we weren't we weren't ever really trying to get signed, 
we 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 did um, you know we had done we had done guitar and beer can, but we hadn't really tried to do anything with it other than just hey 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 you want one of our tapes kind of thing. We weren't even trying to sell them or anything like that. And uh, but then when we did turmoil in the toy box, um, which is you know the one we did in, in the empty house. Um, we said, let's get this in some stores and see what, see what happens. And it was always kind of an inside joke about us because there was a sound warehouse right next to the flower house. That was a house in, in Austin um, for people who know Austin right there, just off North Loop by the omelet tree. And, but sound warehouse was right on that corner too. And they wouldn't take our tape because it wasn't shrink wrapped. And so that was our, so our, we used to kid around with Scott that our whole dream was to have our, our stuff shrink wrapped. <laughs> so that, well, what's that, professional? That was, that was the thing, I guess they, Sound Warehouse was a, a chain. But so then we went to Waterloo and they're like, sure, leave us, leave us some, some tapes. And, you know, the key thing for any band doing that back then is you would have the phone number on, on the cassette contact, you know, this number you know, for gigs, whatever it was. And, and this, this is where Scott Byron comes in. Well, I have, before we get to Scott though. Sure. Okay. Terminal in the toy box. How did you record that? Or how did, how did you guys end up doing that? Yeah, it, it, it was, it was four track and, okay. and, but we just did, you know, and, and that's where, you know, I, I had my experience in the studio, of course, and of course, I, I like to kid Faust that he glommed on to my audio class, yeah. but he learned all this stuff too, right? And um, and then, but but he owned the four track, and he, he really got good at bouncing the tracks and layering things and doing all that, you know, so we, were, we would record everything all at once, you know, live, you know, so the, the meat of the music was recorded live, but the guitar, a few of the guitars, and some of the, well, really, most of the vocals were overdubbed and layered and, and all that stuff. But it enabled you to bounce those tracks back and forth. And, you know, we, we, we knew the, the tech of it, that it wasn't the best quality to keep bouncing, especially on a cassette. But we didn't care. We're just going to make our own tape. And we wanted it to, to sound good. And, those and, things were not bad. Those little boss tacks and those little task camps, they were great. But that's that's where the, the motto, yeah, absolutely. But that's where the motto "Play this sucker loud," which was on all of them, is because that's how you, at least in our minds anyway, that's how you got rid of all that hiss. Is that if you turn it up loud enough, you, you don't hear that hiss anymore. Yeah. So, so you were able to get this out, and this is where is this the tape that Scott Byron found that he grabbed. And he told me, like, kept it in his car for like a couple of months or whatever. No, he had it for a couple of months. He went on a long road trip and right. he popped it in. He finally listened. Yeah. And he went, holy crap. Yeah. You know? It became the soundtrack track for that for that trip for him. He said, yeah. Yeah. What happened was. Yeah, this is what he said. Well, you can tell it. It's probably going to be the same thing he said. No. He said no, he watered. Ahead. He said. All right, I'll, I'll tell you. He said, I'm sure Eric will tell you the story, but this was a very random discovery on my part. I was in Austin for the South by Southwest Music Festival or some other event. And it was I some wandered, other, but... Okay, Go and ahead. I wandered yeah. into a record store and bought a half a dozen demos from a rack of local tapes. I listened to it a few months later on a very long drive and it just jumped out at me. So I went to see them and meet them, and it all went from there. That's what he told yeah. me. Yeah, what it was, and, and the, the, it happened real close to South by Southwest. And so that's that's why, you know, a lot of people in Austin, especially the, the, the media types, they really wanted to credit South by Southwest with, with our, our, our discovery. And it and it did. It played a huge role, right? I'm not I'm not denying any of that. But what happened was a few a few months before that, Scott was in town for a battle of the bands. Um, I, my mind says he was a judge. Maybe I just made him a judge. But he, that's what he was in town for. And then and then he came back for that South by Southwest, and that was the first time we were playing mm -hmm. it. Um, but in the meantime, he he just gave 
a call to that number that was on the cassette. And, you know, it just rings in Eric Faust's house, the flower house, and he picks it up. And you, and you know what it's like for bands starting out. There's all kinds of managers and producers and just all kinds of people that you, yeah, you just kind of don't really trust or you don't know what they're all about. So we didn't know what Scott was about. We hadn't heard of Zoo. You know, it's not like he, he called and, and, and was, you know, throwing all kinds of big names around, you know. R RCA or Arista or Capital or anything like that. We're like, what's this zoo thing? Is it just some independent? Which, of course, that's what BMG wanted to create. They wanted to create a label that looked like an independent because of the whole sub pop thing that was, was happening. But he called us up. We weren't really, you know, taking him that seriously until the, the name that he did drop was Matthew Sweet. And because that was... You know, that was their big thing. He had just, you know, he had just signed him. He said, we have Matthew Sweet. Um, I don't even know that there was any other names that we recognized. But once he did come to see us, we, we slowly realized, hey, this guy's for real. And, um, and then it kind of all got rolling from there. You know, he said, he said that he got that demo. He said, we actually made a few hundred copies of the tape to distribute to people to spread the world word before the release of Kaboom. So, yeah, yeah. And that, no, that, and that's, that's, that's what they did. I mean, they did, they did these, you know, the original one was done in a, um, you know, and then it had, you know, of course, this one where we had our contact information, this one ended up having Leslie Aldridge's contract because this was something BMG did. And so that was, was they actually BMG uh, had them right okay. for, for, for for promotional, oh, you know, cool so that, that we could so we could do a little mini tour before we did the first record. They would have something now before um, that, before he contacted you guys, had you guys been playing gigs? Oh yeah, we, we had we had pretty much kind of become regular openers I'll say in, in the scene and we had even become really regular at the Cannibal Club mm -hmm. and uh, Brad First and Gretchen Barber you know had a partnership and Brad owned the Cannibal Club and he also ran the sound there great one of the best sound guys in, in town um, but they also managed bands and so we had kind of signed on with them as our management Okay. So when, when Scott came along, inevitably we had to make some changes between um, our local management and our local le legal representation once once we kind of had what looked like a real deal on, on the table. Um, and that was, you know, that's what labels do, right? Hey, I, I know this, I, I know Leslie's in New York. She has all kinds of contacts, blah, blah, blah. And I know this guy in Hollywood to be legal and, yeah, you know, so it went like a, not unlike a lot of other bands do. It seems like it kind of went pretty fast because really fast. Turmoil in the Toy Box came out in 1990. They signed Matthew. Well, Matthew Sweet came out in 91. Right. I mean, right. you guys, it just seemed a holy mackerel. Yeah, everything we talked about happened in in 91. And, and so it was the, um, I, I think it was our first tour was with the hypnotics and it was a Northeast tour and it was to get us to CMJ, uh, the, the, the college music journal, the, the festival. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Scott told you all about his extensive experience. Yeah, used to be at CMJ. Yeah. Right. And so that, that was a big thing for him and, and for Leslie, um, to, to play the showcases there. And then we, we planned on, uh, recording in, in the spring in, in, of 1992, which is what we did. I just can't, well, I can imagine, but man, to be a young guy then, I mean, I mean, did you, you must have had a, did you, were you guys just, how were you guys supporting yourselves? Were you guys playing enough gigs to support yourself? Did everybody have part-time jobs? I mean, you went to college for crying out loud. I mean, <laughs> did, were you supporting yourself? Yeah, it, it, it was. Like... It, it was. All, it was all different. Um, 
I, I was, I, my girlfriend at the time, that's my wife now, she, she was a teacher. Mm-hmm. And so she was making a little bit, you know, what, what we considered good money. You know, that was great money at that age. I, I had been, I, I worked as a DJ and then I, I worked in a, I worked as an optician when I was in college. And then after, after I kind of finished with the, the DJ thing, um, which, which I quit in order to do turmoil in the toy box. And then, then, uh, then I was working at the, the optical shop. That, that, that's a whole nother story. I won't even get into It's too long, but I got made the manager of the, the, the shop. And, and one day it was a guy I had known from another job, all this stuff. And so it was kind of cool because I could do whatever I wanted. Really. I have made the schedules and I could work things around the band. And, but one funny story about that was, and cause a lot of people, I've always said Flowerhead, you know, they don't quite get the name of, of the band, which really came from Buzz just doodling in class one day. He just drew the little stick man that you've probably seen, you know, that's kind of our logo. He, he just drew that one day or some version of that as a doodle and it just popped in his head. Hey, that's a flower head. And that's that's how we got the name. But when I was at the optical thing, there was this there was this woman there and my husband knows Jim Ramsey, you know, Jim Ramsey was a big name for booking bands. He booked all, uh, you know, most of the bands in back room and a lot of big shows around Austin. And, and he says, the first thing you need to do is change the name of the band. Well, fast forward a year later, and we've got a record deal that's allowing me to, to quit my job. And she's like, you guys got signed? Yeah, you, you think we still need to change the name of the band? You know, so that was kind of a little poetic justice there. But but once so once we got kind of the initial label money, that kind of put some money in, in our pockets, allowed us to buy a bunch of gear and and all that stuff. And the so, girlfriend supported this. Yeah, she probably, no, I mean, she, I, she I just can't cool. imagine. I just can't imagine how I'd never been in that type of situation where you get signed, blah blah blah. I just it just it, must it, have been incredible. It definitely or helped. scary, one of the two. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it definitely helps. If, if anything, having especially when it's tied to a, a major distributor like BMG, um, it, it gives it that legitimacy, you know. So my parents, her parents, suddenly now everyone's okay with this band thing. So the girlfriend, she was all on board, and Buzz had the girlfriend going. Pete had the girlfriend going, mm-hmm. Eric had girlfriends going. And so that right there, I think really helped with our shows because we had a lot of girls there. <laughs> right. And, uh, and, and that wasn't the case with a lot of, lot, lot of bands. And, you know, I don't know if that was, that was, may have been one of the things maybe keeping us from going just full on loud and aggressive is that we still played, you know, especially in those days, we still played a lot of tunes that were more danceable and, and not, you know, not all about moshing and, um, and, and, and things like that. Songs like all along the way, you know, that would make, make girls dance. Or we used to play trip around the world, which I don't think that made it until the the people's fuzz, but that was always a, a, a good live song for us because everyone would start actually dancing and, and they all had a had a good time, and that would lead to more gigs, you know. So. And I know from talking to Scott before and how things work, but be the time that you get signed and all what there goes in between, it does take quite a bit to get you in the studio. How long did it take for you to from when you got signed to get into the studio? Well, and that's interesting too because you start getting you start working with all these label types and everybody's got their own opinion i think there was one point scott mentioned one of the a r guys that i don't think he mentioned him by name but i think at one point even that guy was t- toying around with being the one to produce us mm-hmm. but we were we were kind of shopping the turmoil as as, as our demo uh, john paul jones name came up and we were real into that and i and i think just timing wise we couldn't get him but we, we went and spent um, about a week with Mitch Easter, you know, who, who had done all kinds of work with R.E.M. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah Mitch, Mitch, Mitch is great. And, you know, we, we didn't end up using him, but we recorded some, some great stuff. And that, that whole time at his drive-in studio um, in, in North Carolina, 
which is on his parents' property there. It's this, this huge property, this huge house, and he had his studio there. And then he, of course, had his big house with all of his guitar. Every room was stuffed with all every guitar imaginable. That, that guy was a guitar collecting maniac. So we, we loved the opportunity to do all that because we got to play every guitar and amp under the sun. Um, Why did you really guys go with... Oh God, I would have thought Mitch Easter with you guys would have been a great I would make sense. Uh, yeah, I don't you know, for me a lot of those decisions were being made over my head or, you know, it with with, uh, with other parties. Um yeah, I, I I got along great with Mitch. But there was also this lingering connection that I haven't told you about this yet and, I, and I, I'm not even sure if you're aware of it. But remember how I said Pete was the one that, you know, that came in mm -hmm. with, with, with with so much energy. Um he had played in, in bands when he was in DC with with uh, none other than Dave Grohl. Yeah, Dave did so, scream, right? Uh, uh, yeah, he had done that. Dane Dane Bramage and yeah, scream and so I don't know exactly where you know Pete and he had done it, but he, he knew him and he knew that that circle of friends. And so once we um, once we were ready to to do our record, I think they wanted that that tie in that Nir Nirvana connection. So the, the Butch Vig studio at that time was, was really hot. Of course they, they re-recorded the Nevermind album in, in LA, you know, the one that everybody knows, but, but the smart studios in Wisconsin was known as, you know, this place where Nirvana had been and a lot of other great oh, bands. Yeah. Killed those are all these bands from the, the Midwest that were really popular back then. And so we, we headed off to Smart, and we had the uh, we didn't get Butch as our producer, um, which we kind of wanted to produce ourselves anyway. So we were kind of more focused on the engineer, and so we had Brian Anderson, who had just got done with the uh, the Smashing Pumpkins record that, that had come out at that time. And then the the really uh, crazy part for me was I I never I don't know if I had the true appreciation, especially not as much as I do now for Steve Marker and Duke Erickson, who to me, I guess they were just those old, those old guys hanging around the studio, you know, helping out. They weren't initially assigned to our record at all, but by the end, Steve was, was doing most of the engineering work. And then, you know, those are the guys that are in, in garbage with, with Butch. Um, so I always thought that was really cool. What I thought was these old guys, you know, they're just hanging around the studio they were rock stars in their, their own right. And they weren't all that, that old either. And they weren't all that old either. Exactly. Exactly. And, and they and they were older than I even am now and st were still out there gigging big time. And it, it, it made me just go, what was I thinking? You know, just the way you are. It's just, it's just the way it is. Yeah. Hey, it was 1992. Yeah. Well, or 91, whenever you recorded it. I, well, I was known for kind of being an idiot, I guess you'd say. And, and I, I, there would be people that I should have known who they were. And, and I just was completely clueless about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that brings me to, back to a, a, a Matthew Sweet story. The first time that I met Matthew, it was it was at the CMJ. I guess this would have been the CMJ happening in 1992. Um I mean, I think we were on the bill. That that was the year we were on the bill with Rage Against the Machine. It, it, it was kind of a big deal. Teenage Fan Club. Um, who else was on there? I'm looking. Uh, Fatima Mansions, Live, Bedlam. I've got a, some posters over there. But Matthew's there, and he's there with Amy Mann. And so I, I'm just completely focused on Amy Mann. Well. And... And I get introduced to Matthew, but it just kind of, I guess, just blew right by me. I thought he worked for BMG. And it's later somebody said, he doesn't work for BMG. That was Matthew Sweet. And I'm like, oh, fuck, that was Matthew Sweet. And, and I just kind of said, oh, yeah, hey, man. And that was it. And I blew my chance to, you know, at least talk to Matthew a little while. But, um, I think some of the other guys, you know, got, got some time with him. Now, he is real, you know, real quiet and reserved. So that probably wasn't the ideal circumstance to try to have a conversation with, with Matthew anyway. Yeah, I kind of get them all mixed up and we would uh, all around that we would also we would play CBGB, you know, two or three different times within the week or so that we were up there for CMJ because 
our, our manager, Leslie, had real tight connections with Hilly and all the people at, at CVGB. So that, that really became our home away from home. But then, you know, we'd also play the wetlands and um, the limelight and, you know, the, those kind of places. And yeah, loved, loved New York for mm -hmm. sure. So how, how, let's see, record Kaboom, and then it gets released. Now, I have to tell you, I remember seeing this record back in the day, like on OSU campus. I mean, it was oh. out there. Okay, so you, you were in Stillwater. Well, I remember seeing the, the artwork, the, the cover. I remember seeing the CD in the bin. Well, we we spent some quality time in, in in Stillwater and made some some lifelong friends um, that were just guys we met at the show and said, "Hey, you can come. We're having a party, you know." And it basically, we lived with them like for almost a week mm -hmm. because we had we had like another show that we had to go do in Oklahoma City. That was right around the time of the Oklahoma City bombing. We we played at the Bricktown Brewery there, and all the guys with their three I say it while I have three digits on my shirt, but you know, the, the ATF and, you know, the governor and, you know, all these people were all at that, at the Bricktown Brewery the night that we played. And it was a very weird, kind of a weird scene. None of those people would have been there to see us. They just happened to be there because it was this big place that everybody went, but, but yeah, Stillwater. So we, we, I think, I don't know what year would you say that was? When you, when, when you, I, uh, you saw uh, the album cover. Well, it must have been 92, 93. I have yeah, that would have been around the time, I think. Mm -hmm. But they were out there. So after you recorded it, how long did it take for it to come out? After you mixed it and all that? Yeah, well, and, and, and that was kind of an, an interesting story in itself. And, and, and this happened on both Kabloom and the people's fuzz and it, it was eric faust you know was really driving the the producing and the mi mixing and and all those things and and you know like a lot of other artists you, you you do the production you listen to it you think you've got it down and then suddenly you decide you're just going to do it again <laughs> or i, I want to redo this piece or i want to redo that and so we I don't think we, we hadn't uh, on Kabloom, we hadn't mixed it yet, but once we got home, we ended up doing um, some work on the record, w including a, a completely different song that we recorded at Cedar Creek Studios in Austin with our old, old pal, uh, Jim Wilson, who has a pretty extensive uh, career in his own right as a, uh, as an engineer and, and producer. And, but Jim had, had, run sound for us a lot. He had gone on the road with us and, and we loved him in the studio. So he was kind of our fixer on, on a lot. I'm, I'm really on both albums. And, um, you know, so we did, we did uh, everything is beautiful was recorded completely separately from the, the rest of the record. I, I think you can hear it. Um, it, 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 there's there's a lot of things, especially with the drums, uh, that, that were a lot different than the way we recorded the drums. And I think I when we were kind of emailing, I think I told you that one of the things about Butch's studio is they always wanted to use Butch's um, drum tube, and it was I forget if it was Butch or if it was Dave Grohl, but it was this long plexiglass tube that he would put in front of the kick drum and get all kinds of different mic sounds all at different lengths. Of, of the tube and we got a bunch of great stuff but i think in the end um we ended up sampling a lot of the kick drum with a, a, a bob clear clear mountain kick drum that every <laughs> everybody liked to use <laughs> oh my god well it, it was of the time so maybe yes. you did so during the summer that was in the spring and, and it was probably around summertime that Eric Faust went up to the carriage house in uh, what was it, Connecticut or, or somewhere up there uh, with Lou Giordano. And, and, and those two mixed the record on that one. Nice. And, and then, and then we, we toured on that with Ned's Tom and Dustin when it came out. How long were you out on the road for that? You know, it was probably the Ned's tour was 
was all over the U.S., you know, so, um, you know, started off by, you know, heading out to New Orleans and, you know, all the, you know, worked our way over the, the East Coast and then came came through the top, you know, Chicago and Cleveland and all that, mm-hmm. and hit, hit the Northwest and then down and then finished in, uh, in San Diego. And, that must have uh, been an incredible experience for the fact that you never toured before. I well, mean, it, we, we, had, we of, had toured. We oh, we, you we, had. we had done the little mini tour. You know, I wouldn't call it a mini tour, but it it, it, it was just a northeast, um, you know, jaunt with the hypnotics. It was a, a a British band, the hypnotics. They were the Rolling Stones. For all intents and purposes, we were hanging out with the Rolling Stones. They talk like them. They look like them. Their mannerisms, everything, and. Um, yeah, so so we had that that's what we did, you know, with the with the turmoil in in the fall before. Okay. All right. And then we did the Neds, and then um, and then of course it was somewhere in there that we hooked up with Blind Melon, and that's who we ended up doing the majority of our touring with. We did a couple, you know, a lot of different just legs and things. We would join them in different places and just kind of here and there. It wasn't necessarily touring behind, you know. We're promoting this this record. The, the the one that was really promoting Kabloom was the the Neds. How did it sell? Or I you mean, know, I mean, I, I you will, know, I will tell you a funny story out, that yeah, everything has to start somewhere. You know? Yeah, yeah, and I will tell you a funny story because you know they are tracking things. We're getting stuff almost every day, okay. and um, and we we had this big spike of sales in South mm-hmm. Florida. Mm-hmm. And I kind of had to, do I tell them? Do I tell them? Because <laughs> they couldn't understand it. We, You've never even been to Miami. You've never even, you know, I mean, we may have hit Jacksonville or somewhere up north, mm-hmm. close, Atlanta. I know we had played. Um, but what's, what's this thing with Miami? I have like a shitload of uh, family and cousins, aunts and uncles, all these, all this family in, in that area that were going to the, they, and they were, they were making the record stores sell out of them and, and causing them to reorder. And I had to fess up that that, that wasn't actual or organically happening. That was family. Oh, wow. uh, hey, we, we loved it nonetheless. But, you know, I've heard reports of anywhere between 12 and 15,000, although I, I, I think, um, 12 is probably the more realistic number. Um, anything going much more than that, I, I don't think is, is going to be true because they simply didn't press that many. Well, the thing is, when you listen to a, a track like Snagglepuss, it could have been, I don't know why that didn't take off because that catchy, memorable, it was of its, you know, it fit right in with all the Nirvana. I'm not saying you guys were grunge or anything, but right. I mean, it fit we, in with we, a, a lot of that music that was going on during that time, you know? Yeah. I mean, we did get lumped in with the grunge. A lot of people wanted to call us psychedelic grunge or, and we just, I mean, to us, we were just playing rock and we were just writing songs that we, that we wanted to write. And, and, and like I said before, it, it was Eric Faust, but let's be very clear. Eric Faust did, you know, 98% of the vocals on the, on okay. the record. So I was, I was backing vocals um, live and would attempt to, to, to do his parts. And then, you know, Pete, you, you can definitely hear Pete and, 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 you know, Pete does the, yeah, yeah, yeah's you know, and, and snaggle puss. And so his vocals are very present on, on Kabloom. And then, you know, mine are in there somewhere a little bit, probably on all along the way. And, but, but as far as the records, Faust, he, he was really good at harmonize. Like a lot of singers are, he could harmonize mm-hmm. with himself. And, you know, the best I could do was maybe an octave to whatever he was singing and, and, and do all that. But, yeah, so, so 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 we got that cleared up. But the, the the way we did write though is like a lot of bands do. It, it would start with a riff, and then somebody would bring in a riff, and then we just kind of start jamming it and kind of build a song around it and start you know building a a chorus in and a, a you know well, it typically started with a verse and a chorus and we'd come up with a bridge and but. Yeah, the, the, the majority of our writing w- was done by Eric Faust. 
But you probably did. You have all of the bloom ready to go when you went to the studio and all that. I mean, yeah, pretty much. Other than everything is beautiful. Like I said, I, I don't even think that song was written before we before we went to Madison. Um, you know, to record it smart. I, th I think we wrote that after we had already had everything in the can. Gotcha. It, it just came up with that in the studio and said, "Hey, let's 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 get this down." And then and then it became something we wanted on the record and it ended up it ended up being on a uh on a uh, one of these comp compilations that i have here yeah so this one is a compilation that we're on i don't know if you can well, see the that the alternate alternative way everything beautiful comp everything is beautiful mm -hmm. so that song was on here but we also got the title for the for the compilation, which oh, we thought we, you know we were we were on several comp compilations, but that 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 was the one that I got excited about anyway. That they kind of used us as the title cut. You know, I do have a question about that because Scott Byron and I were talking about how with Matthew Sweet, he was all into. Of course, Matthew was probably recording a lot of stuff. You know, he's right. a busy man, um, but how you know he had a lot of extra bonus tracks and stuff. And he wanted like on um, Altered Beast, they put out a lot of EPs and stuff. Right. I was looking on Discogs and I say Snagglepuss came out like a single, but it came out in a, on a CD single in Germany or something. Right. I mean, were you guys like the European market? Did it like take off over there or what? You know, we, we had a lot of, a lot of stuff happen in Europe and we were even going to tour Europe. Uh, with driving and crying, and they get they ended up on a um, on a Leonard Skinner tour, you know, which was perfect for them. But yeah, here's the um, yeah the single you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it had the cool artwork. Album comes out, you do the tour. Tour is over. How long in between that and the people's fuzz? So that's like ninety five. So. Yeah, so so the People's Fuzz was actually we actually recorded that, and we decided to stay home this time because the the being we spent probably a month and a half in Madison before on Kabloom, and and okay. it it turned out to be kind of too long for in in a way, um, and so we just decided to to stay home. And, and record it. We looked at it, it virtually every studio in town. Of course, we knew Jim at, at Cedar Creek. And, you know, I think it may have even come down to a booking issue as to why we didn't record it at, at Cedar Creek. But but we went in the Arlen, you know, the famous one, the, the one owned by uh, the, the Willie Nelson family, mm -hmm. you know, for F Freddie Fletcher, you know, and, and, and those guys. And, uh, I like the kid around that we built their big cutting room because they, at the time they had a big cutting room, really decent sized control room, but they, they have, now they have an even bigger cutting room in the, in the back. And, uh, but I used to kid with them because that was under construction when we were in there. And I said, yeah, did, did, did our check, you know, uh, enable you to, you know, Freddie did that check enable you to, to build all that stuff and he'd just say no comment. <laughs> just this is uh, this is actually a record. This is like a BMG record club issue with this. I don't know if you know it was in the record yeah, club. Yeah, you know, I was gonna tell you, I mean, we, we talked about it before we kind of really got rolling, but but I was the the member of the band that um that I wasn't a fan of having the picture of them. I wanted to be more mysterious, you know, like Led Zeppelin. If we are, no, this is mysterious. Them. Well, but on the first one, I, I, I kind of was too loud about not, not having the band. And, and what it turned out is I didn't, I wasn't on there. I'm way in the back. I'm the Sasquatch in the back. And I thought, well, okay, that's They were like, you didn't want to be on anyway. So you shouldn't be too, too upset about being way in the back. But Buzz had worked with the art, the art direction, the art director Lee Hammond and and um, and you can't and, even see you hardly on here. yeah I'm in the back and in in the round one on the on the green vinyl I'm I'm completely cut off which is funny to me but for the people's fuzz um, you know er, er, Eric Faust kind of had this you know this vision of of the girl at a carnival right 
the girl at the carnival with, with some creepy guy checking out her ass, you know, or whatever. And, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, just kind of had this vision. And then, then we talked about what we wanted to do or what I wanted to do was kind of the old Mad Magazine thing. We knew we wanted a big widespread, you know, a big panoramic thing. Yeah. And what I wanted to do was have, you know, the front be this and then the back would be the back view of her head and the back view of all these people mm-hmm. and, and then have it fold around, do this panoramic thing. So it would be like, you know, a Mad Magazine kind of thing. But what happened was the, the jewel box loader, the way it had to fold, it was like a, yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. It, the, the way it had to fold wouldn't allow it to put the, the it wouldn't allow the way we, because you can see what had to be on the back would have to be on that other side. This is yeah. cool, a massive collection of, uh, of fuzz pedals from a local vintage place here. Um, but but do you, this is Did something you, a lot of people don't know about the, the people's fuzz is, is that artwork is not, that's not animation or anything like that. that that's a photograph of a statue, oh, wait, of a sculpture, I should say. That is a six foot long sculpture. Um, and maybe you can see it. I, I, I wish I'm sorry, I'm for, forgetting the guy's name, but it was a, an artist who had worked on the set de- decorating for the show Pee Wee's Playhouse. <laughs> right. So the, the Pee Wee Herman set designer built this six foot sculpture and then they meticulously photographed it and obviously did some other some other things um man i can't find it uh, you know it's listed on here somewhere oh yeah who the yeah, sculpture who the, mitch greenblatt there you go mitch mitch mitch, mitch greenblatt right yeah good guy um I, I i've asked and i don't think anybody knows but i i I'd, I'd love to know if that thing even still exists it's hard to imagine somebody keeping something that size and that looks like that in their house unless they're really into it. Maybe Mitch has it. I don't know. We were talking about Byron about the Matthew Sweet and how they did the artwork and stuff. Did, so did the zoo art department come up with this? Um, well, zoo, z- yes. Lee Hammond mm-hmm. it, working yeah. with Buzz. And, and, you know, it's kind of like with our video, you know, computers in the early 90s were kind of just really getting rolling on the graphics. Mm-hmm. And so, like, that stars effect throughout all that. Yeah. That, that was Buzz and Lee just playing around in the zoo offices with their computers that had all the fancy technology. And and Buzz just going, hey, you know, because we had, we, we did the, the photography for the, the pedals ourselves. Okay. I had some pretty decent... Um, Canon, you had a Canon Rebel, you know, pretty decent 35 millimeter camera, along with a little bit of training from my RTF days and, and how to use the camera. So that that picture, we, we took that picture ourselves, as well as um, what we thought might be the Kabloom album cover, the, the picture of the speaker with the, with the flowers coming out of it. Oh, uh, I got it. Uh, it yeah. And so, yeah. And so that that was just kind of using like a rack focus thing, you know, to get the main part of the shot and then pulling back on it to get the get the blur from the plastic flowers that we had sticking out of an old speaker. Um, And then we tried some special effects, but we really had one shot at it. And so because we wanted to make it look like it was exploding more. Mm-hmm. And so at one point we lit the speaker cabinet on fire and tried to <laughs> and tried to blow it up, and those photos just didn't didn't come out as well as that one did. Needless to say, I'll tell you though. But all this, like even this on Kabloom, you know the inner, they did yeah. a nice. It's a very nice design. You know everything looks really great. Yeah, you know, and that's, same with that's, the Matthew Sweet stuff. It looks great too. Yeah, they that and they the zoo was so generous about a band like us that hadn't sold one record and and they were we were getting these the, the, these artworks on, on the cassettes too have all the really the pull the long pull out artwork and you know a lot of a lot of people weren't spending money on that in, in those days. I mean, they put some, you know you look at this. I mean, they were putting some money in into this. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and before I get then there's not a, not a quite, there wouldn't be a question, but you made me think of it when we were talking about spending money on us. Like I said, they were, they were very generous with all the, you know, with, with the green vinyl. Right. I, I think I think I was showing that before we, we actually started the interview. But right, you did. Yeah, th- yeah. This is what you know you, you'll get in the, in the mail. But they did these just purely as promotional copies, and then once once we had moved on to the second album, they just sent us thousands of these. And, and we, out and out. Yeah, when we played like one, of our, one of our last big shows was with the Goo Goo Dolls in in our hometown of Irving. And it was kind of you know home hometown kids you know return home and 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 so we we just threw them out like frisbees um, during that show so we probably gave out you know two or three hundred of them and then had to autograph them all which was kind of weird. But, uh, but what I was going to say about the spending of the money is is just in recent years and and I know that with, with Scott he talked in in good length and deservedly so about Lou Malia, who, who was running the, the, the label. And something had come up when we were friends on Facebook. So this would have been about a year or so before Lou passed. Um, he sent me the a, a really nice note. And because I had said something and there was some conversation going on about Zoo and, and, I, and I just mentioned how the Zoo Zoo was like such a family to us and really to all of their artists. And Lou was the dad. Well, Lou, Lou just sent me out of the blue one day uh, a, a note that says, I'm, I'm trying to see it because I have it hanging hanging up on my wall up there. Um, but it, 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 it's something to this effect and I can send it to you, but it says, I wish I could have been, been a, a, a better dad. If, if only the Germans had believed me in how much tool was going to sell they would have let us spend more money on you guys and i thought that was really cool and and you know scott scott touched on it um if, if you get bill manspeaker on here he, he can definitely tell you tell you the stories about about green jello and, and tool but uh but yeah lou knew all along from uh the very first time he saw tool live he knew they were going to be huge and, and and the Germans, which very affectionately, by the way, we always referred to BMG, the Bertelsmann Music Group, right, as the big mean Germans. People's Fuzz comes out in 95. Yep. And as you know, in the other show with uh, Scott, we talked a little bit about that whole shakeup where they did all the layoffs. Yep. Yep. And that's, that's when that So happened. was this, that was in 95, right? Yeah, it was it was it was all ninety five. But this record is this pre that is this pre layoff? Yeah, it, it was it was virtually the same time. We, okay, we, we, touch we on just, that a little bit. How did that? Just, yeah, no, that's 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 a good one. I mean, we we just barely made it under the wire with with getting whatever they did press on the people's fuzz as, as far as the CDs and cassettes. There were no vinyl for that one. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was just barely under wire. I mean, it was around this, the same time as South by Southwest that year. We, we didn't even bother to apply to be accepted and, and get get on a South by South, South, South by Southwest showcase in, in 95 because Zoo was really rolling at that point. Or, well, everybody thought so. And so they had um, they had set it up to have their own stage. And, and it was, unless I'm getting it wrong, Matthew was headlining and we were, we were opening for Matthew and then, or Shaver, maybe Shaver was, some, maybe Shaver was before us. Scott talked about Billy Joe's Shaver, the country mm-hmm. yeah. artist. Yeah. He so recommended that stuff too. And so it was this big, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, Shaver's cool. Um, but we had this big outdoor stage you know, just off of Sixth Street, you know, and there's all kinds of other venues around, but it meant that anybody could come to our shows. You didn't have to have the South by, South by Southwest wristbands or anything. Um, however, what happened, what happened to us, and, and, and I'm sure Matthew wasn't very happy about it, um, and, and I may be confusing Matthew with Shaver, but, but either way, um, 
Soul Asylum was playing across town at the same time as our set. And we were, we were kind of, or at least we really wanted to be, but even our fans were, they'd rather go see Soul Asylum. So all of our local fans and really everyone that would have normally come to see us, they, you, you could tell exactly when Soul Asylum was going to start because about 15 minutes into our set, everyone just starts trickling away. It looks like we're you know, driving everybody away. But this is how funny it is. And this is how funny Buzz is, is after that happens, Buzz, you know, is going, hey, can we, you guys, is it, you guys okay if we cut our set short? I think I can still maybe catch the last 20 minutes of Soul Asylum if we oh, no. <laughs> So even our own band members wanted to leave and go, go see Soul Asylum. Um, well, I guess during that time, Soul Asylum was doing pretty well, though. So. Yeah, they were they they were a big deal too to have it at South by Southwest at that, mm -hmm. but it, it was it was very bittersweet um, because all the all the zoo people were there, but they were no longer with zoo. But they so, were still there. But they still showed up. You know, I mean, they're still you know trudging through. But our 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 dinners and things were a little less. You know, bittersweet is just the best way to describe it. You know, we were going to have this great time with our own stage and all these things. And now we're all looking for, now we're all here with carrying around our resumes. But, but, but Scott wrote a great article about that. If you can ever, ever find So that. was Scott still with them or he'd been let go already? All of them, all of the a &R, they had no more A&R people at all. It so be, when this record was being released, did you know that there was something going on or it just happened that God, it probably all uh, happened within weeks okay. of it. And, and so then, so we, we thought we were still good, which really we weren't, um, but no, they only it, kept Matthew sweet, right? Well, I don't know exactly what happened as far as who they kept and who they sold the volcano or any of that. I think so first there was a moratorium on new signings. So we're okay. There's a moratorium, no more new signings. And then the A&R staff all gets fired basically. And, and then, and then we're going, you know, what's going to happen to us. We had changed management. We had, a, a manager up in, in Dallas at this point. And, you know, we had, that's when we had Kyle was in, had joined the band for, for the people's fuzz. And, and then we just got the word that BMG was pretty much just shutting down zoo. Mm -hmm. We never got any word that, Hey, we're going to be picked up by volcano. Although I think volcano and some version of that still owns most of the zoo catalog. At least as far as the CDs go, it's not like they own the publishing. It might be. I think I Sony so. might own it now. I think it is. I think Sony may have bought bought the stuff from Volcano, but yeah. But Matthew and 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 Tool, mm -hmm. even Green Jello in some weird way, you know, they were all fine. And some of the more established bands, like you know, if you remember, Great White was on was on Zoo at one point. Oh, wow. <laughs> God, I thought they were like on Capitol or something. Maybe they, they they've were been on a lot of different records, but the, but Zoo, Zoo had this thing where, you know, Scott mentioned how they had like, you know, there were certain bands that were just cool that they didn't want to see, mm -hmm. see exist and not on a label. So that's how the killing joke, you know, and but then Procol Harum was one of them. They were probably, you know, the oldest that's right. band that ended up uh, on Zoo. Um, you yeah, know, they had, but they had such a, such a uh, diverse group of artists, even though they kind of designed it to look like an indie la label, mm -hmm. they couldn't help but sign artists that would have done just as well on RCA or Arista. And one of them is Phyllis Hyman. And I don't know if you know the tragic story behind Phyllis. I we, do not. We won't, we won't talk about it here. People can Google can it, look at, can Google it and, and learn the, the tragic story, but it, it, it is, I mean, this may give a hint. This was called Prime of Her Life, Prime of My Life. Mm -hmm. um, we met her at um, this big party that um, that Lou threw one time in LA. 
that that's when we really felt like rock stars. When you're the the president of the record company, guy who discovered the cars, huge mansion, big pool, all kinds of fancy people there, you know. And but yeah, the poo sticks is is one of them. I I wanted to show while we we're going through these. But here's one I don't know if Scott turned you on to, and I don't know if it's really your thing or not, but body count. You know, was a thing at that that time. Ice T's band Body Count, yeah. and they were kind of the like a you know the heavy guitar, yeah, hip hop kind of stuff. Spade Ghetto Destruction. Never heard of it. Yeah, but that's that that's one that I actually like to, to listen to. And then these guys, I think you mentioned Sonny Landreth. Yeah. Excellent guitarist, and then of course the always fun Web Wilder. You know. So those are those are ones from my selection. I had, I probably have another twenty to thirty zoo CDs. I'm looking up to where it is behind my camera, but uh, that was just a selection. They were very generous about giving us the the CDs. Polygram as well, our our publisher Polygram. They would just open up the files, and we would just walk out of there with CDs up to our necks. But it, it was interesting because Zoo only gave us four, one for each member of the band, because they didn't want they, they wanted your family in Miami to be buying them. Right. Mm -hmm. But when it came to all the other ones, they were like, take one of each, you know, because they wanted everybody in the, the Zoo family to to know each other. So I'm assuming that when the People's Fuzz came out, you didn't tour to back it. I, I don't think we we toured with any um, support behind it. You know, as far as like it was before with, with, with Kabloom that we would have BMG people, you know, there was this one girl that would show up in every town. She worked for BMG and mm -hmm. she'd show up in a flower head costume, like an all green jumpsuit with like a big flower head. You can picture it, right? I, I remember the one that. time she came out during one of our shows dancing on the stage, completely unbeknownst to us. <laughs> and we had to all be going like looking at her like, what the, what the hell, hell are you doing? You know, at least talk to tell us you're going to do that instead of ha making this look like it's part of the show. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I just got off of that. So we didn't have any any of the promotional type people. But I'm pretty sure that's when we did a look. We did a little short stint with Cheat Trick. OK. Um, and that's clearly our biggest name uh, that, we, that we ever toured with. But it was really just a, a, a short one, you know, just a, a part of their leg. We, we played this huge place in Houston that George Jones was going to be playing at, you know, the next night or whatever. And they had their walls of marshals. Next night was Tipitina's, which we'd played there a few times. Always cool. That's where we had played a show during on the Neds tour with, with Stone Temple Pilots kind of inserted themselves into our tour at Tipitina's in, in uh, New Orleans. And then we finished it up in, in uh, Memphis with, with Cheap Trick. And that's, that's, that's where we, we got to know the band a little bit better, particularly uh, Tom Peterson. What happened? Okay, so you got on this tour, Cheap Trick. Zoo's falling apart. They've dropped you off the roster. Then what? Ha what happens with the right. band? Right, and then, so you then guys we still keep have, going, yeah, or do you we, go? No, and you're right. We're we're exactly at the at the, at that crossroads, right? Because we also have new management that's still excited about doing all kinds of stuff for us. He's trying to talk us off the ledge. You know, I can get another deal and, you know, do all this. You know, did, did it with this band, did it with this band. Um, and then, but you know, like I mentioned that Goo Goo Dolls show, that was, you know, probably our third or fourth to the last show. And then we had a couple really just kind of random little commitments that we had to do. And then, and then we were going on a hiatus. You know, I, I mentioned that Faust was a, um, you know, he got the sailing scholarship. Mm -hmm. Well, in between the time from in 1984, when he went to USC, you know, several times in college and maybe even early when we were even doing Flowerhead, whenever the Olympics rolled around, whatever those those years were, he had, he had tried out and come very close to making the Olympic team for the a laser, wow. the laser class sailboats. And and so once we kind of came to this crossroads with, with being dropped from the label, and it really was more like the label being dropped from BMG, you know, um, and then it was just a trickle down effect. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he kind of told us, my last chance, you know, I'm not getting any younger. I want to make another serious run at the Olympics. 
Um, I don't think you know he didn't he didn't make he didn't make the team as far as to participate. He, I think he was part of part of the team in some form. I, I know that they used him a lot to push the younger guys, you know, to to be better. And, and he was he was just really good at that sport. And he still works in that sport to this day. Um, so once once he had done the Olympic run, he just kind of started working and doing doing just different things out at Lake Travis. And so the whole sailing world became became his life. And now I forget which exact class he's kind of jumped around from different classes. Mm-hmm. I think he may be back with the lasers now. Um, but he's like an international director and flies around the world and organizes regattas and all of those things. And, and then just in the last few years has little, little kids. He's, he's, he's got a couple, he's got a, a little girl and a little boy, um, much, much later in life than, than most people do that. So that's going to be interesting to watch by the time they get in college. Yeah. Well, at least he followed his passion, I guess, but man, Guy just has a lot of talent. I mean, and, then, and then what I did. Yeah, I what probably, happened with you? I probably just started. I, I probably should have focused more on just trying to join another band that was doing pretty good. But I kept going back to my my original dream, which was being on the other side of the glass. Right. So if you remember, that's what I was doing in college. That's what I wanted to do was engineer, maybe someday, you know, become a producer um, kind of thing. Even had you know great mentorship when I was in college. Uh, Dr. Robert Brooks pretty much got me to graduate. But even when I'm talking to him, you know, right at the end, he says, "Don't expect to make a lot of money in this in this line of work. It's very rare that somebody somebody's going to make a a whole lot of money. But you can find a way to make it, make a living, you know, doing it." So I was all into doing it. I was doing an in, in, uh, internship at Lone Star Recording Studio. Um, which is, you know, fairly famous in a, in a sort of way, um, in its own sort of way, um, in Austin. Um, and was kind of looking at other studios. But, but all that happened around the same time that Flower, Flowerhead asked me to join up with them. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of, in a way, sort of got derailed from pursuing the career in the studio. And I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm working in a studio and I'm and playing. It doesn't get any better than this. Mm-hmm. And so, but so after everything wound down, you know, as you can see, I ended up with the, you know, the big board and a lot of this is new stuff, but I have our, our, we spent more money on our Eventide harmonizer than we did on our van back in the day. Right. And so, so I, st- so I still have some of that, that old stuff and then some new stuff, but we were using ADATs then, right. Remember the, the eight track on a super VHS, ADATs and so I I bought another ADAT and uh, so then I had a 16 track studio basically that was it was portable and so then I set out to to just sort of do my own thing producing you know demos and and that sort of thing and just just local bands so I did I did some artists one artist that was was a good friend of the band and uh, James Oliver he, he owns an art gallery now you know in, in Pennsylvania um, you know, the poachers, uh, one that was a good friend of mine, Victor Flores, uh, you know, a local Austin artist, um, some, some, some kids next door, you know, it was, it was just random stuff at that point. And, you know, it, it, it just, something like that only lasted, lasted so long. And, 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 and probably for the last about 94, in between the time that people's fuzz was being released um, or since once it was in the can and it wasn't going to be released till 95, that's when, you know, Buzz gets a job and then, and then Buzz's wife and my wife were good friends. None of us were actually married yet then, but Buzz got a job, you get a job. And so we kind of started getting day jobs at that point. I ended up at a JCPenney catalog call center because they would, allow me to leave when we did have to go on tour and do things they would allow me had real flexible schedule and then and then when the when my kind of independent producing thing you know didn't have much prospects i really got into learning the call center technology and i still work in that business today so 
Well, it's nice that your girlfriend supported you during all that. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, no. And, and she reminds me of it often. She probably does. <laughs> yeah. But, it, but it she really was a did. teacher the whole time, right? Is that what you said? She was a teacher? She was a second grade teacher. Okay. She later became a, you know, a gifted and talented where she had all of K through five, but she was an elementary school teacher. And Buzz's wife was a teacher too. Although Buzz's wife, I think graduated, she's just younger than, than my wife. So I think she graduated a few years later. Um, yeah. So it was, it, it, it was great having, having that kind of support and then from the family as well. Right. right. So did you ever play in like any other bands or anything at all after this? Um, no, I mean, not, not, not anything, you know, near the, that level. I, 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 I've kept playing and then uh, actually this shirt, oh, here's my plug for my recent band, but what, what Flatlands Picnic, what Flatlands Picnic is, though, is a living room band, you know, pi oh, picture wow. Daryl live at Daryl's house mm -hmm. without Daryl Hall or any of those other people that he has. <laughs> or his whole band. <laughs> or any of, any of his guests. But think, think of it as a, as a local lesser known version in the DFW area. Yeah, you know, we have a couple guys that are, uh, you know, just in gigging and and it's all cover band stuff. You know, it's, but no it's, other Flowerhead band members ever get together. Uh, no, I mean we we've 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 talked about it forever, and I'd still be up to it. I still got all this stuff. I still got all the exact stuff that I used then. You still have, and, but then I have a new stuff that's even better. Um. And and fortunately, the parts, most of the parts that, that I w would write for myself or that would kind of just write themselves, um, I can still play. Is that the same uh, Les Paul up on the wall? Th yeah, that is it. Got, I got that from, from a local guy in, in Austin in 91 for like 300 bucks in 1980 custom. Those were the days when you could get a deal before they went through the roof. Speaking of Les Pauls, I don't know if you've known this, but I have to get this in because I know we can't just go on forever. Uh, right. So There's going to be too much too much stuff. Um, but <clears throat> Steve Jones, Sex Pistols, famous Les Paul guitar. Yeah, he doesn't have that Les Paul anymore. Okay. He sold it to a friend of ours oh. when he was in Houston Steve Jones wanted a Harley, and so he stole it, sold it to our friend Reese, and I used that guitar on the People's Fuzz. Anyways, I do have pictures with that guitar. Here's the kicker, all right? So we had, Reese even had, he had let Guitar World, one of the lesser mm -hmm. guitar player magazines, guitar, I think it was Guitar World, oh, wow. they did a whole thing, the Holy Grail of Punk. Did a whole photo spread with a British flag, that guitar, you know, the, the stickers and, and, you know, the cream color, you know, just oh. that guitar. And I had that guitar in my possession, you know, for a couple months. We even used it for some live shows and stuff. Reese was just a great guy, you know, just, hey, yeah, use my use my guitar on the, on the record. We had a Gibson endorsement then. They, they would send us whatever we wanted and not to keep, but but to use on the record. That guitar had such mojo. Here's the kicker. All right. Okay. All right. About four years ago, or maybe five, uh, I joined a Facebook group, The Gibson Les Paul. Mm -hmm. And I'm sharing that story. And then people start talking about it. And they were like, well, you know, he, he sold that guitar several times over. No, what are you talking about? Well, he would buy guitars that were very similar to that one and dress it like the original guitar. And then he did sell it for seven, eight thousand bucks. So now I'm sitting here and I don't know, was I ever was I really ever using the original one? Or was my friend somebody he duped and selling one of his knockoffs that he was making at some point? Yeah, but you should know. be able to date it. I, I don't know, but to me, having a friend that got ripped off by Steve Jones. It's almost a better story in a way. And and ultimately the guitar sounded awesome and still had 
excellent mojo. When you, when you hear all of what we would call this alien sound effects on the people's fuzz in between songs. Yes. That's because we were in, we were in, uh, Jim Wilson had the, his connection. Fred Rimmer owned Cedar Creek studios in Austin. And then his brother, Travis, Travi Rimmer had a studio just out in, in the woods, basically in, in Bernie, Texas. And his wife owned San Antonio, SAS shoes, San Antonio shoe factory. This huge business, which is loaded, right? So he had this huge, with a, with a video production suite upstairs, just this beautiful studio just out in the, out in the boonies. And so we were, I, I was recording a lot of new tracks um, that are on the People's Fuzz and only half of them got through the mix, you know. So when we when we mixed People's Fuzz, we did that at Chick Korea's place in, in LA. But then we, we re-recorded a ton of that at, at this place. I don't even think it had a name. It was just Travis, Travis's studio. And um, it, it, that guitar, you, if, if, if you just leave it alone and not, you know, set it where it wouldn't feedback, but it, it would just, after a while, I, I think it must have been picking up some sort of, because Bernie, Texas is near San Antonio, so it was probably some sort of Air Force thing. Mm -hmm. But that guitar would start picking up all of those sounds. And if you just let it sit there long enough, it would just start chirping. So it's just picking up the, the signals whatever, from the planes. Whatever it was. Radio but, but we're like, this thing's picking up aliens, you know? And was, so we mic'd it all up, and then we had those sound effects run through the whole album. Uh, so, so that's where that that came from. It was all through that Steve Jones guitar. I don't know. It might be that guitar. I don't know. It, what it, year it did he? Get, what year did the guy get it? Well, you see, know? that's that's what makes me believe it. I mean, that's it, a long time it, ago. It, it was the first early. sale, but 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 at least you know how guys in these Facebook guitar groups are, right? They know everything. Um, but some have said so and so owns it, and he's always owned it, or whatever, and. It, it, it would have been 94 that Reese mm -hmm. bought it. I don't know. It's a good story. I, I know. That's what I said. It makes a good story either way. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So, probably should wrap this dog up. Um, do you have a favorite record out of both of all these, flat, of the two Flowerhead albums? Which album? You know, I think most, like Scott said, I think most are going to lean towards Kabloom, but just the the selfish side of me likes the people's fuzz more. I'm I'm more I'm a little more present. You know, so there's pretty there's there's pretty distinctive ways, even though we both kind of did some crazy things. Buzz is the the, the far superior guitarist. He he's the 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 you know the 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 really sweet melodic stuff. I, you know, worked on some melodics, O'Shane or whatever, and I, you know, I did some of that. But that's mostly going to be buzz and the really chaotic stuff. Like if if you think of the song Overdrive, that just has the little bleep bits that are just pure noise, and a, that was what the kind of stuff that I was doing down in Bernie, Texas, out in the middle of the woods with that with that Steve Jones guitar. And with my octave wah and, and my roto vibe and just a Marshall, you know, Marshall 50 watt just cranked. Yeah. So, oh, so there good. it is. Yeah. But that one, yeah, I like the second album a lot. Even though so, yeah. Scott right? recommended the first are. album, he recommended the first album, but I think the second album is my favorite. Everything for me that you've done all happened in that moment with that look on your face when when Scott was giving you new bands. Wow, I like it. It was like, like yeah, stuff. Wait, stuff. I don't really know that much. I, th I wait. I'm, I have a glimpse of seeing that album cover, and the rest was a mystery to you. And 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 the the, the way that you got excited about that, yeah, just it. that meant so much to me, man. It really did. No I'm glad we got to talk. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I, I'm always I like looking for something. Doing. I'm always yeah, looking I, for stuff. I like what you're doing. And I, I watched your your very first episode or whatever you would call it of this channel. 
Oh, yeah. And and one of the things that I, I love about what you said, because I think you mentioned the contrarians and all that stuff. Yeah. And and you know, hey, I wouldn't mind getting in on doing some of this stuff if I can if I can find them. So let's let's do, keep in touch about doing this kind of stuff. Sure. You sure. know, I've got my microphone like you and everything. Hey, if there's shows you want to get on any discussions, I've got a there's a messenger group that I've just kind of you you know uh, Facebook Messenger that all these guys that are all on this Facebook Messenger thing. So I mean, well, if you've got like Messenger, to... I could put you on there. You could go. Oh, that topic would be good. Uh, you know, be, be on some shows. That, you know, let's let, 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 let's talk about it. But um, but what I liked about what you said on that in that intro was the internet's a. I guess you were getting maybe some criticism, oh. like, "Hey, what are you doing this for?" There's well, no, there's I was criticizing. I was criticizing myself. I was going, you know, why on earth would I even do this? It's stupid. Right, but then you said the internet's a big place. There's plenty of room for all of us to have and have some fun. Sure. And that that really struck home with me. Like, hey, you know what? We're doing this for us. Everybody else comes second, you know, as far as, right. It's not like you're, you're trying to become an influencer. You're doing, you're just, you're just wanting to have some, you're just wanting to have some good conversations and kind of capture it and and create some content that some people might find enjoyable. And I really, I I dig that, man. And if we can turn on some bands that people haven't heard of, let's do it. There you go. That's the whole thing. And then when you've reached out to me, I thought, shit, if this is Flowerhead. Holy mackerel. We can, you know, who's talking Flowerhead? Let's talk Flowerhead. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Right. Let's right. get it out. Let's talk about it. Right. I don't know. And, if we can turn and on. This friend, uh, think about it, Eric. If, if we could turn 10 people on to, to Flowerhead. How cool is that? I mean, even if we get a couple people turned on to it. Yeah, that's that's right. That's cool. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, we you know, Buzz particularly because he's a big Apple guy, mm-hmm. but we all were. We were so excited to get on to finally get on iTunes and Spotify. It was actually Scott who discovered that and let us know, mm-hmm. and and that was really exciting. Not because. Hey, so, our sales might go through the roof and suddenly because people get paid pittances on that. Anyway, it's not about the money at all. It's more about the everything living on through the Internet. Both of these are on Apple and Spotify. Yep. OK, here yeah. I'm buying all this physical media for God's sake. <laughs> Hey, that's, now, that's uh, what I like, though. That's what I, I like. Gonna say, I don't want, if, I don't scream if, or do any of that crap. If you don't want those, I'll buy them because I, <laughs> I actually lost my original copy of Kabloom and, and had to buy one. Well, there's plenty on Discogs. <laughs> I want to thank Eric Schmitz from Flowerhead and our discussion for tonight. Holy crap, was that fun! It's like going right down memory lane, you know. But I appreciate you coming on. We've talked about. Holy crap. There's a lot of things that I had no idea that even went on with that band, but I'm so glad that Scott Byron turned me on to you guys. And actually is without Scott Byron, we wouldn't have been here today. Exactly. And it's Yeah. Thanks. Thanks Grant so much for, for having me. It was a it, lot it, of fun. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. So, all right. want to thank everybody. Please check. Okay. In case you don't know this, the two Flowerhead albums are available on Apple Music and on Spotify. Now, you can probably go find CDs on Discogs or on eBay maybe, but you can listen to this band on Apple Music and Spotify. So please check it out because that's what this channel is about, giving these bands some love. So check out some Flowerhead and share it with your friends. Play that sucker loud. Play that sucker loud. (laughs) All right, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Eric. Nice talking to you.